It's great to see all of you here today. Why, thank you very much. And for those watching online, thank you for being with us today as well. We're currently in a sermon series entitled Summer Playlist, which is a takeoff on the, the music playlist we put together for the different times and seasons and occasions of our lives. You know, Christmas playlist, vacation playlist. This is the summer playlist. And very appropriately, it's based on the book of Psalms because that's what the Psalms are. The Psalms are the songbook of the Bible. The Psalms are songs. There's 150 of them in total. And in those 150 songs, we see the entirety of human life and experience laid out for us to witness. The Psalms are a, a window into the human soul. And they're written through every emotion known to man. There are psalms of, of great joy and celebration and praise. And there are also psalms of hardship and struggle. Some were wit written in times of great victory, but others were written in times of, of deep pain and sorrow. They cross the spectrum. They, they span the entirety of life from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows. And because of that, the Psalms meet us right where we are. No matter what we're going through or what we're experiencing, the Psalms meet us where we are. They're true to life. They're authentic. They're, they're real. And they show us that we can be real as well because we serve a real God who's able to deal with whatever it is we're facing. The Psalms let us be authentic. We don't have to pretend to be something that we're not or, or that things are better than they in fact are. We can be real because we serve a real and mighty God. The Psalms were written over many centuries by, by several different authors, uh, but about half of them were written by David, the young shepherd boy who later became king. And obviously, as a king, David experienced some tremendous times of blessing and joy and celebration. And a lot of his psalms were written from, from, from that vantage point. But David understood the other side as well. Because even though he was a king, he did not have an easy life. In fact, what David went through, what he endured through his life, is beyond what most of us can even imagine. His predecessor, King Saul, tried to kill him repeatedly out of jealousy because the people loved David more than they loved Saul. And so David had to run for his life and hide out in caves in the desert like a, like a wild and hunted animal. When he finally became king, there were literally enemies on every side. And so the wars and the battles raged continuously. David had a son who betrayed him. He tried to usurp his throne, and he died in the process. And as you'd imagine, that, that whole thing, that whole episode, it broke David's heart. David had a devastating moral failure. He fell deeply into sin. He battled life-threatening illnesses. He lost an infant child. David was no stranger to difficulty and pain. He knew it all too well. And so time and time again in the Psalms, we hear him crying out to God in his distress, in his pain, and in his sorrow, but always with a note of hope because he knew that God was with him. No matter what he was facing, he knew that God was with him and that God would see him through. That's why the Psalms speak directly into our lives because we all experience difficulties. We all experience problems, relationship stress, health concerns, trouble with the kids, conflicts at work. None of us are exempt. We've, we've all been through it. We've all been there. And most likely, you're here this morning and you're dealing with something even this very morning. The Christian life, you see, isn't a life without difficulties and problems. 
No, it's, it's a life that faces those difficulties and problems with God, knowing that whatever happens, no matter what's going on, He's there with us, He's present, and He will see us through. And so we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to hide. We don't have to pretend. We can bring it all to Him. That's exactly what David did, and it's what we need to do as well. And that's the big idea of the sermon today. We can bring our greatest needs to our even greater God. We can bring our greatest needs, whatever they are, to our even greater God. And one of the most beautiful psalms where we see this in action is Psalm 86. It's a prayer. It's a model prayer, in fact, for, for being authentic and real and for coming to God and crying out for help in our time of trouble. We don't know the exact circumstance of this, of this psalm, but there were a group of men who were seeking after David. They were trying to kill him. Now, we don't know, we don't know exactly which group of men that was. It could have been Saul's men hunting him down in the desert. It could have been men from invading armies attacking Israel. Or it could have even been uh, people, traitors from his own inner circle rising up against him. We don't know precisely which group of men were coming after David and attacking him. But whoever it was, the situation was dire. It was life-threatening. And so David comes and he pours out his heart to God. He cries out for help. And so let's look at Psalm 86, and we're going to read through the whole thing in its entirety and then come back and look at a few of the pieces a little more closely. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol from the grave, from death. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me, Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This was a desperate situation for David here. There was absolutely nothing that he could do to help himself. All he could do was turn his focus and his attention on God and cry out to him for his help and deliverance. That's all he could do. But that's exactly what he needed to do. And it's what we need to do as well. We need to, we need to bring our greatest needs to our even greater God. And like, like we mentioned, this psalm is a model prayer to do just that. And so let's dive in and look at a, a few of these pieces a little more closely. David says, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Well, David was a king. It's, it's not, he's, he's not talking about material poorness, but what Jesus talked about, being poor in spirit, being broken, humbled. He's poor and needy. 
Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And so here's David's cry for help. And that's, and that's always the place that we need to start. Because in order to find help, we need to, to recognize that we need help. And, and we need to, to, to humble ourselves and reach out and ask for it. And David did. David was humble. He, he asked for help, which is pretty amazing in itself because he was a king, right? He was the guy that everyone expected to be strong and independent and to have all the answers. But even so, David wasn't afraid to recognize his need and ask for help. And that's so important to see. Help me, Lord, answer me, he said, for I am poor and needy. I'm broken here. You see, he wasn't afraid to, to be humble and vulnerable to ask for help. In fact, that was the secret of David's life. He realized that he didn't have the strength himself, but he knew that God would be strong for him. David knew the truth of the Lord saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. <laughs> David embodied that truth. He lived it out his entire life. That, that's how he was able to stand up to the lion and the bear when they attacked his father's sheep in the field. That's how he was able to stand up and face the mighty Goliath with nothing but a slingshot and some stones. And it's how he was able to go out repeatedly into battle against these massive invading armies because he never went out in his strength. He knew he didn't have any. He always went out in the strength of the Lord. He knew he belonged to God. And no matter how weak he might be, he knew that God would be strong for him, that God's power was made perfect in his weakness. And that is just so freeing, right? That's so freeing for us to see and to know. We don't, we don't have to pretend to be stronger than we are. Now, we can be completely honest. We can, we can acknowledge our need, and we can cry out to the one who makes all the difference, the one who's, who's with us, the one who walks with us, the one who will see us through no matter what it is we're facing. It's an intimate relationship. It's a beautiful picture of trust and dependence. That's the way it was for David, and it's, it's the way it needs to be for us as well. Preserve my life, Lord, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts you, for you are my God. Relationship, deep and abiding relationship. David cried out to God for help, but then... David shifted his focus off of the immediate problem and onto the goodness and loving kindness of God. David says, For you, O Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. God is good. He, he really is. And, and we, need to, we need to hear that and grab hold of that and really take it to heart. You know, it's possible for us to hear the phrase, God is good, so many times that it, that it starts to sound trite, right? And it kind of blows right past us, goes in one ear and out the, out the other. But we have to guard against that. We really do. We have to continue to be awestruck and to marvel at the goodness and the graciousness of God. God really is good. And all of his intentions and his purposes toward us are good. So we need to internalize that. We need to hear it. And we need to allow that to transform our, our attitudes and our, our perspective. We often say the words, God is good. But we don't always live like we mean it. A lot of times we kind of shy away from God. We kind of tiptoe around, right? Not one to draw too much attention to ourselves because we figure if God really knew who we were, 
he might want to even the score a little. <laughs> but it's not like that. God already knows exactly who we are. He knows everything about us, and yet he still desires relationship with us. How awesome. And he sent his son, his only son, to die and rise again for that to be possible. That's how much he loves us. It couldn't be more. That's how good he is. And he's ready to forgive, David says. Ready to forgive. How awesome is that? You see, we don't have to try to convince God to be gracious and forgiving. No, that's who he is by his very nature. He wants to pour out his grace. He's ready to forgive. He desires to forgive. And again, he sent Jesus to show us just how much that's so. And so what are we waiting for? Right? Why are we trying to hide? Why, why wouldn't we run to the Father like David did with whatever we're facing, whatever we're going through? He's ready to receive us. He's good. He's ready to forgive. And he's abounding in steadfast love to everyone and anyone who calls upon him. And the word here for steadfast love is a very special word. It's the Hebrew word hesed. Hesed. And it stands for that deep, committed, covenant love that God promises to his children that he will never take away that he can't take away because it flows out of his very nature and his character. It's the hesed of God, his steadfast love, his forever mercy and kindness and faithfulness to his children. And he doesn't just trickle it out. No, he's abounding in it. And not just to David, but to all of us who call upon his name. Could it be any more inviting than that? <laughs> right? Could our God be any better than that? He's so good. He's so ready to forgive. He's abounding in steadfast love. And so we should be running to him. Not walking, but running to him with whatever we got, whatever it is we're going through. He loves us with an infinite love. So, so we need to bring everything to him. No matter what it is, whatever, whatever we need, we need to bring it all to him. That's what David did. That's how he lived his life. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you. And why? For you answer me. You see, David knew from his own experience time and time again that God not only loved him and wanted the best for him, but God was faithful to him as well. God answered when David prayed, and he met the needs in David's life. God did that for David, and he'll do that for us as well. You know, it's a great thing to have someone who loves us and care about us and who lends a listening ear when we need it. That's a wonderful thing. But it's an even greater thing to have someone who not only cares about what we're going through, but who also has the ability to respond and meet that need. And David's telling us here that God's both. God's good. He loves us and he cares for us more than we could ever possibly imagine. But he's also a mighty God, a great God who can do all things. David says, there's none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. It's an awesome thing to know that God loves us with an infinite and steadfast love, just like David explained. But it's even more awesome to know that our infinitely loving God is also infinite in power. God's not only good and gracious and willing to help, but he's mighty and strong and he's able to help. <laughs> and isn't that awesome? That's the perfect combination. That's the combination that we need. You know, when I was a little kid, 
um, me and my friends, we loved to climb this tree in our side yard at the house. But we couldn't do it by ourselves because the, the first limb was too high for any of us to reach. And none of us were strong enough to be able to boost each other up to grab a hold of it. But when one of my older brothers or their friends were around, well then no problem, right? Because they were big enough and strong enough that they could boost us up so that we could reach that first limb. Um, now the analogy breaks down real fast because wow, my brother and his friends were able to lift us up and boost us to the first limb. They weren't always willing to do it, right? Unless we bribed them with some baseball cards or sweet tarts or something. But but not so with God. We don't have to bribe him. He's good and gracious and willing to help, and he's great and mighty and able to help. For you are great, David says, and do wondrous things. And it's true, he does. And we all know he does because we've all experienced that at one time or another. When we stand on a mountaintop and we look out and we see the beauty of creation, when we experience the birth of a child, right? when we watch broken and tattered relationships being mended and restored, or when we come out the other side of a life-threatening illness, in all those ways and in so many more, we get to see and witness the wondrous works of God. We get a glimpse of His glory, and we get to praise Him. And when we hold fast and remember those things, all that he's done for us, all that he's brought us through, it deepens our faith and draws us closer to him, and it strengthens us to be able to walk through the next trial that we face with all of our hope and trust fixed firmly upon him. There was, there was a young man who attended C3 several years ago with his family until they left town and moved down to Florida. And for several years while they were at C3, and even after they moved, he experienced some, some truly debilitating and horrific chronic health problems. And he prayed all the time, and we prayed for him, for the Lord to heal him. But it, but it didn't happen. Not in the timetable that we were expecting and desiring. But about a year or so after they moved to Florida, I got an email from him telling me that God had finally healed him. <laughs> and, and you could just feel the joy just coming through the email, the lightness of heart. And then just a few weeks ago, thank God, he and his family were up here to visit and they were able to swing in and be with us on a Sunday morning. And seeing him in person... It was just night and day difference. He, he looked strong and vibrant and joyful. He looked like a, a, a brand new person. And he talked about how God used that experience to deepen his trust in God, to deepen his dependence, to draw, us, to draw him closer to, the, to, to God. And he was, there, he, he was actually thankful for what he had gone through because of what God did for him in deepening his relationship with the Lord, as only God can do. Now, for sure, there's going to be other trials in, in his life, just like there's going to be other trials in our life. That's just part of the package. It's, it's, it's part of life. But one of the greatest gifts that God gave him to bring him through the future trials is the remembrance of God's steadfast love and faithfulness to bring him through the last one. And the same is true for us. God is great and does wondrous things. He has done wondrous things in our lives. Wondrous things for us to cling to and remember, to hold on to. And that's what David did. He remembered God's goodness, his steadfast love, and he remembered God's greatness his mighty and wondrous works. And as he did, something amazing began to happen in David's heart. David began to, to gain a whole new perspective of his situation. 
He was no longer fixating, obsessing on the immediate problem at hand. No, now his focus and his attention was on the Lord himself. And David finally understood his real need, his, his, his real need and his true heart's desire. And it was a renewed desire for God, a closer walk in relationship with him. And that only makes sense. I mean, when God is so awesome, as we see in this psalm, and when we take the time like David did to remember just how awesome he is, well, it, it changes us. It changes our perspective. It changes our priorities. And we begin to desire God and to praise him like we should. The way that he's worthy to be desired and praised. And so David says, and we close with this passage, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of shale, from the depths of death. David's crisis, his problem was not yet over. But, but God gave him the grace to be able to park that for a second and to be able to turn his attention back to the Lord. After meditating on the, on the goodness and the greatness of God, David, David's heart was filled with this renewed desire to be closer to God, to know him better and to praise him more. And isn't it just like God to do that? Right To take a problem or, or a struggle that we're going through, something that's weighing so heavy on our hearts, and use it to humble us, to show us our need, and to draw us back closer to him than we've ever been before. God wants relationship with us. He desires us. He desires to be in relationship with us. And so he uses everything, including our hardships and our trials, especially our hardships and, and our trials. He uses everything to show us who he is and to draw us closer to his heart. And that's what we really need. Great is your steadfast love, your hesed toward me, David said. You have delivered my soul from the depths of shale, from the depths of the grave, the depths of death. And right there, a thousand years before Jesus was born, David, in a nutshell, laid out the gospel. Because his deepest need wasn't deliverance from invading armies. Just like our deepest need isn't the surface problems of our lives. No, David's deepest need and our deepest need is deliverance from sin and death and reconciliation and restoration to God. That's why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's exactly what David just said. Jesus came to deliver our souls from death. He came to lay down his life and to rise again so that we could have new life in him. And the new life, the abundant life that he gives us it doesn't start when we get to heaven. No, it starts right now. It's an intimate walk in relationship with him that we enjoy right now. A relationship where we can come to him with whatever we're going through, where we can bring our greatest needs and know that he will hear us and respond to us with steadfast love and faithfulness. It's not a problem-free life but it's a, a life that meets each problem with him, with the one who made us and who loves us with infinite love and faithfulness. That's what we really need. He's what we really need. <laughs> and our souls are finally satisfied when we're resting in his love. And so that brings us to the next step that, that I would ask each of us to take. This week, think, think about a situation or an area in your life that's just weighing really heavy on your heart. Could be, again, a relationship struggle. 
It could be a, an issue at work, a health problem, something going on with the kids. It could be a thousand different things. But whatever it is, bring it before the Lord with absolute honesty and openness. Bring it to Him. Don't, don't hold anything back. Lay it all out there. If there's anything you need to confess, do it. Confess it to Him. Know that He's ready to forgive. But just get it all out there openly before Him. And then remember His goodness and His graciousness toward you. Remember that He's waiting and, and, and ready to forgive you. Remember that He's abounding in hesed, in steadfast love for you. Think about the last crisis that you went through and then remember His faithfulness to you to be with you and to bring you through that. Meditate on and remember God's goodness. And then spend some time and remember His greatness as well. Go for a walk in the park or around your neighborhood and just soak in the beauty of creation. Think about the miracle of each of your children and your grandchildren. Think about how awesome God is and then remember that He is both willing and able to help you. And then after you've done that, after you've spent this time thinking about the, the goodness and the greatness of God, at that point, stop for a second and see if your perspective hasn't changed a little. Right? The problem is most likely still going to be there. But is your perspective and your attitude about it moved a bit? Are you more balanced in how you see it? <clears throat> And are you experiencing some peace in the midst of the storm? I think you will be. Because you'll be approaching the situation, the problem, whatever it is. You'll be approaching it in relationship with Him and in His steadfast love for you. And that's what abundant living is all about. That's what our souls long for. That's what our hearts truly desire. We all face difficulties and needs in our lives, but we don't have to face them alone. We have a God who loves us and who's willing to help. And we have a God who's strong and mighty and able to help. So we can turn to Him and run to Him. We can bring our greatest needs to our even greater God. He's inviting us to do just that. And that's what the Lord's Supper is really all about. Jesus invites us to come to Him, to walk in relationship with Him, to live with Him, to bring everything we have, whatever we're going through, to bring it to Him and to know He's with us. That we're in communion with Him and also with one another. That we're here to help each other, to to bear one another's burdens, as the Lord has called us to do. That's what the Lord's Supper is all about. And we get to celebrate that this morning. We get to come into His presence and know that He's with us and know that He's ready to help. At C3, we practice open communion, which means that you don't have to be a member here uh, to participate. Um, you just need, need to belong to Jesus. Put your trust in Him. If you haven't ever done that, you can do it right where you're sitting or at home. You can put your trust in Jesus and know that he came for you and he's there to help you and he's calling you to himself. If you haven't had a chance at home, go, go grab a, a, a piece of bread and some juice so you can join us. We have the cups here and there's two pieces of, of little cellophane. The first is to expose the wafer um, and we'll do that first and then secondly, you'll the next piece that you pull back will expose the, the juice so that we can have uh, communion together. Um, we're told to, to come to the Lord's table in a worthy manner, which, which means to know that in ourselves we're not worthy, that Jesus is worthy, and we're made worthy in Him. If there's anything in your life that's, that, that's just that you just need to take before God and have Him wipe away, do it right where you're sitting. Just confess it and know that He's ready to forgive. He's ready to receive you and, and wash it away and make you clean.
This is a great time for us to practice what we just heard this morning in the, in the, in the lesson. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he took bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to yourself. We thank you that you receive us with open arms. Lord, that you are good and ready to forgive and abounding in steadfast love. And so, Lord, we run to you. We come to you. And we thank you that in this time of communion right now that it just shows that we are in that relationship with you and with one another. Lord, you are, you are present to give us help when we need it. We're present for one another to do the same. And we thank you for pouring out your grace and your steadfast love on us. Lord, you are so awesome. You are so mighty. We praise your name. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.